Okay. So, what did you guys think? Cool. Yeah, that was awesome, Bob. I knew radiation played some kind of part in this model. Remember I told you that? At, at some point, I know radiation has something to do with this. But um, Oh, yeah. That's, that's when I had my ferrocell, and I was trying to manipulate the uh, the field with radiation, and I, I failed. I didn't have any kind of a discovery with radiation and a magnet and a ferrocell. But you that's guys awesome have put today. it together that it's the celestite and radiation. I mean, that's really cool. Yeah, well, and that, and we haven't really talked about that part of it yet. And when Cami comes back up, but what I'm going to do, and and this, you know, this is something that we're throwing out for people's consideration. But we tend to think that there is a that what the moon is made. Of, I'm just going to say it straight up. We believe that the moon is made up um, of a mineral composite, mostly comprised of a mineral called celestite or celestine. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and... Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean hey. to spill the beans there, Bob. Oh, that's okay. No, that's fine. No no worries. No worries. Um, Celestine, we'll go Celestite. Okay, so we actually have a chunk of this here. Now, what's interesting about this particular mineral is, you know, I, I had I hypothesized previously that you know, when we looked at some of the footage that I shot specifically with the P900, um, and you're looking at it, it almost looked like we were seeing like inclusions in a crystal or facets on a crystal, uh, like some of the, you know, what would be called like the, the lakes or the mares um, on the moon, uh, we believe are actually facets of this celestine or celestite crystal. So what's interesting about this is Celestine has several qualities that that um, when it's in sunlight, it will tend to glow kind of a sky blue color, okay? And then you can see some of the face, the facets um, and the inclusions. Uh, another thing that's very interesting um, is about Celestine is that it grows as a geoid, meaning it's a sphere and it's hollow. Okay, so a lot of a lot of people have heard about, uh, you know, NASA supposedly hitting the moon with a bomb or running something into it, and it supposedly rang like a bell. Well, assuming that that can actually even be done, um, that would seem to back up that claim. Of course, uh, I I leave that highly questionable. But uh, another thing that Celestine does is it fluoresces with. Uh, different wavelengths of ultraviolet um, from the hey, short hey, to the Bob. longer. Yes. Sorry, Bob. The, the next picture along, so now you have this skull, the next picture to the right, um, mm -hmm. sorry, if you go up, if you look up, the next picture to the right has spheres. Uh, to the, oh, this one. Okay, yeah, yeah in geoids. Yeah. Yeah. So there it is in geoids. Didn't you say that's how the way it naturally grows, Bob? Did you mention it? It is. It is. Wow. Okay, and Another interesting quality about celestine is it has an extremely low magnetic permeability, okay, meaning that magnetic fields do not penetrate it well. In fact, they, it tends to act more along the lines of a superconductor, um, you know, when you, when you supercool it, um, it impedes magnetic fields and it will have a tendency to ride on those magnetic fields. When you, uh, uh, one of the videos I posted last week um, by Ephesians 612, um, and we've all seen it, uh, it shows that when he dips the little crystal um, in plastic into liquid nitrogen and it super cools it and then he puts it on magnetic rails and then, you know, makes it fly around the track. Uh, that is, what's happening is we're actually decreasing the magnetic permeability of that little crystal structure that he's doing. Ken Wheeler also demonstrated that again with the uh, quartz crystal um, who does, uh, which does not have anywhere near as low of uh, the uh, permeability that that uh, Celestine does but also if the moon is up there in space you know more or less or high up where we think it is it's probably very cold up there which would also tend to increase its quote-unquote super conductivity properties or decrease the permeability even further. And if we are operating under the assumption, uh, and I believe the fact, that the magnetic fields are indeed emanating from the plane, um, especially in this, this, this uh, tri-magnetic field um, that is constantly rotating and changing, it, is, it would not be 
unusual or it would not be unexpected to to be able to see how the moon is kind of going around there floating around in a circle. Of course, that would imply also that the moon is a ball. Um, and this is where we get into um, the idea of it's not necessarily reflecting the visible light because, again, if we shine visible light on a sphere, it diminishes as it gets to the edges, which doesn't make any sense. However, if we, if we are shooting a radiation at it, and believe me, Celestine does have this quality, um, it will fluoresce the stone, and it will fluoresce it, interestingly enough, in gray, in white, and in blue. <laughs> which that's are exactly awesome. the colors that we see. Yeah, that's this. So it is like giving up its own light in that respect. Then yes, yeah, it really is. Awesome. Absolutely. So, and this is absolutely amazing. Of course, I think I showed a lot of people. Um, you know, you can take a little. Uh, I have one of these plasma balls, which is great. You take a plasma ball and you take a, uh, a, fluorescent, a fluorescent light bulb. Yeah. Yep, and you fire up the plasma ball and you hold the fluorescent light bulb just in the proximity of it and these the electrostatic, you know, energy coming off the plasma ball fluoresces the um now another thing that they say is that when celestite does fluoresce, it fluoresces in a cool white light. And they are very specific about saying a cool white light, which I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, you know, uh -huh. um, you know, very much like a fluorescent light. So all I'm saying is that it's interesting that they, that it has every single quality uh, or or attribute of something that could be up there as the moon, uh, reacting to not only visible light but long and short wave uh, ultraviolet, as well as um, uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, all, all of the above, and it, it fluoresces in different ways when it encounters uh, different parts of that. And of course, as the angle is hitting, as Cami just demonstrated, uh, on, this, on the sphere itself, and this of course is, would be assuming that the moon is actually a sphere, um, this would be something that could very much explain it. Now when you look at the facets on Celestite, and you look at the moon very, very closely, the facets very much resemble um, some of the things that we see inside of the moon. Uh, on really close inspection, and uh, CD does that. I guess Take Back Space TV does uh, a moon feed quite often that shows a lot of this. Features. You're talking about the surface features. The surface you? features, right. And That's what I'm saying is like, you know, Merichrysium and, and uh, the Sea of Tranquility are actually facets on the mineral itself, okay, just like we're seeing here. In other words, the faces of the stone. And the reason that we see it kind of rocking back and forth would be it's, it's corresponding to the phases of the electromagnetic waves that it's riding upon. Now, one of the ancient descriptions of the sun um, is uh, they describe it as a one-wheeled chariot. And I find that very interesting because when we look at like Chris Van Matre's uh, video uh, of the sun and we're looking at the sunspots, and we're seeing it, and what's happening with the sunspots is they are, they are kind of going around the sun counterclockwise backwards, but on a wheel effect, okay? So it looks like it's spinning around on a wheel, and, you know, that kind of, again, goes right along with this, this model. It's uh, the sun, the sun may or may not be a sphere. Um, that's kind of hard to say. If it is, we're certainly still only seeing one face of it, but uh, I'm kind of inclined to think at this point that that maybe the sun isn't necessarily a sphere, um, yeah. but you know who knows. Uh, Phuket uh, Word has also uh, shown the the sunspots turning um, on the surface of the uh, well, what we see of the sun, the sunspots doing this cartwheeling. Right, the wagon yeah. wheel effect, I call it absolutely, yeah. and and yeah, that's that's super interesting when you think about that because that just seems to really make a lot of sense. So um, yeah. Uh, Cami is, of course, a gemologist. Um, she is also a rock hound to the nth degree. Um, she's always been very interested in that. She bought uh, diamonds for 30 years for a very high-end jewelry store here in Denver, and she's traveled all over the world um, buying them. She really knows her stuff when it comes to rocks, I'll tell you. Um, 
and uh, it's interesting. Oh, one other thing I want to say about uh, Celestine or Celestite. When you start looking at the metaphysical area, uh, metaphysical uh, write-ups about Celestine, it is tied in every way, shape, and form to the moon. Um, and that, that to me just amazed me because, you know, I do put um, some stock in, you know, what we would call metaphysical uh, knowledge or, um, you know, hidden knowledge, occult knowledge, if you will. Um, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. People will say, oh, that's all hocus pocus. And I got to tell you, that's part of our programming to believe that anything like that is hocus pocus, but in fact it is not. And I'm sure I don't have to speak to a lot of this community to understand that there are many things that do not, you know, meet the eye that that uh, are explained by mainstream science, and they definitely have occult um you know, explanations to them that actually make a lot of sense. But yeah, when you look at uh, Celestite or Celestine in the occult, it is tied to the moon 100%. It's absolutely you know, amazing. Okay, so what did you guys think? Cool. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome, Bob. I knew radiation played some kind of... This is something that we're throwing out for people's consideration, but we tend to think that there is a... That what the moon is made of, I'm just going to say it straight up. We believe that the moon is made up um, of a mineral composite mostly comprised of a mineral called celestite or celestine. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and... Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean hey. to spill the beans there, Bob. Oh, that's okay. No, that's fine. No, no worries. No worries. Um... Celestine will go Celestite. Okay, so we actually have a chunk of this here. Now, what's interesting about this particular mineral is, you know, I, I had I hypothesized previously that, you know, when we looked at some of the footage that I shot specifically with the P900, um, and you're looking at it, it almost looked like we were seeing like inclusions in a crystal or facets on a crystal part in this model. Remember I told you that at, at some point I know radiation has something to do with this. But um, oh, oh yeah. That's that's when I had my ferro cell and I was trying to manipulate the uh, the field with radiation and I, I failed. I didn't have any kind of a discovery with radiation and a magnet and a ferro cell, but you guys awesome have put it together that it's the celestite and radiation. I mean, that's really cool. Yeah, well, and that, and we haven't really talked about that part of it yet. And when Cami comes back up, but what I'm going to do, and and this, you know, 